Welcome to this introductory video to the Rolex 24. I'm Bryant the Chinchilla. Whether this is the first time you're watching the Rolex 24, or maybe this is your first time watching a race in general, I'm here to give you a guide so that way you won't be lost when you're viewing this race. So what is the Rolex 24? Well, the Rolex 24 is an endurance race, and this race specifically lasts for a full 24 hours. No, don't worry, you don't have to watch it all. Most people don't. But it is nice to catch up on certain bits of action here and there. This type of racing is meant to push man and machine to the limits, to see what can really be done in 24 hours. It's a test not only of speed, but of endurance, hence endurance racing. With most endurance races comes class racing. In the Rolex 24, there are four classes. The DPI, the LMP2, the GTLM, and the GTD classes. Each one of these is classified by a certain list of specifications. For example, the DPI class, which stands for Daytona Prototype International, is the fastest of the four. These cars look very strange compared to the cars that we see out on the road, and that's because these types of cars are meant to produce speed on track. They are built specifically for performance on track. A similar story with the LMP2 class, or Le Mans Prototype. These cars are a little bit slower than the DPI class, but they are still quite quick. The next class down is the GTLM, or GT Le Mans. This class is based more on production cars, cars that you would see out on the road. While these cars are closer to what you would see out on the road, they are enhanced for track performance. A similar story with the GTD, or GT Daytona. While these cars are the slowest out of all the four classes, they are still very quick out on track. Because there are specific classes in this race, you will hear something called position and class versus overall position. Position and class refers to the position of that car in its specific class while overall position refers to the overall positioning in the race. For example, a car in the GTLM class might be third in its class, but might be 22nd in the overall race. The track that they will be racing on is the road course in the Daytona International Speedway. Because of this, the circuit has an interesting layout. The start-finish line is in the middle of the banked trioval, which quickly leads down to turn number one. The sweeping left-hander of turn number one leads directly to the quick turn of turn number two, right into the International Horseshoe. Where a short straightaway takes him to the left-hander of turn number four, followed by another horseshoe at turn number five. Turn 6 takes him onto the banked corners of the NASCAR track of turn number 7. Where it leads onto the long back straightaway. Turns 8, 9, 10, and 11 make up the bus stop chicane on the back stretch, which then leads to turn number 12, which puts them right back onto the straightaway into the triangle. Some of the places to watch on this track are turn number one, the International Horseshoe, and the bus stop chicane. These are where a lot of passes get done and where a lot of failed passes end up happening. Another aspect of endurance racing is driver changes. Because the race is 24 hours long, it's not realistic to expect a driver to last for the full 24 hours. It is mandated that each team has at least two drivers per car, but most teams will have at least three or four. Each of these drivers is expected to take over for what's called a stint. Each driver will have a certain number of stints to complete in the race. A stint is an amount of time that a driver will spend behind the wheel. For example, a stint could be one hour or a stint could be three hours depending on how long they want to keep that driver in the car. With these driver changes comes a different type of pit stop. Normally there's only four people over the wall to help change tires, give fuel, fix up any damage on the car, and do any routine maintenance. 
However, when a driver change occurs, an extra crew member is over the wall to help with the driver change. Typically, these pit stops last less than a minute. However, if there is more maintenance going on to the car, it could last longer. For example, some brake changes might be needed. Because these cars race for 24 hours, some routine maintenance is always needed. Whether this is changing out brake pads, bumper covers, repairing any damage that might have taken place on the racetrack, or anything else in between, occasionally some routine maintenance will be needed in order to help the car keep going. If a car or engine sustains too much damage, it will retire from the race, or in other words, it will no longer be able to compete. Some racing series take a closed garage as an official sign of retirement. So if you ever hear of a certain team or car having a closed garage, that means that it is officially retired from the race. With so much money in each team, it's easy to assume that they might come with backup cars for events like this. However, that's not the case. If a car is wrecked during the race, that's it for them. And if they happen to wreck during the practice sessions before the race, the team has to repair the car in time for the race. If an accident or spin-out does happen on track, you might hear of a full course yellow or a local yellow. A full course yellow slows the entire field down and puts them under the control of the safety car. When this happens, it's usually a bigger event that will take a lot more time to clean up. A local yellow only affects part of the track and serves as a warning to drivers who are about to enter that part of the track. As far as most endurance races go, a little bit of rain won't stop the race. However, if the rain gets too bad, or if visibility gets impeded too much, a full course yellow can come out. If the track is not expected to get back to conditions where they can race, they will stop the race entirely and let the clock run down as they wait on pit road. During the night hours, you might notice that some drivers flash their lights at each other. What this means is that a faster car is upon them, and that they should watch out. The same message is conveyed by blue flags, which are waved by officials around the track at slower cars. One of the last things I'll be covering in this video is who is allowed to race, and is there a limit on how many can drive? In order for a driver to compete in the Rolex 24, they need to pass current IMSA regulations and possess a current IMSA membership. As far as a limit goes on how many people can race, I don't believe that there is any, although I might be wrong on this. As far as I know, there hasn't been any regulations on how many is too many. Some of the things that are specific to this year's Rolex 24 include the new version of the Corvette, racing in the GTLM class. This year's Rolex 24 will have the lowest number of cars competing in 35 years, with only 40 entrants total. Another thing you might notice is that there are no Ford GTs in this race. The Ford Racing Program has pulled out of most of the races this year, so you won't be seeing much of them in pretty much any race this year. And that's about it for this video. Hopefully I've been able to give you a little bit more knowledge as to what to expect to see in this year's Rolex 24. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to get to them as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.